Welcome to the video ministry of Salem Primitive Baptist Church, located in Gravesville, Arkansas. I would like to thank you for viewing today and hope you are blessed in the Word. I would also like to invite you to come and worship with us in person. We have worship service every Sunday morning at 1030 and Bible study every Wednesday night at 630. Please like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to us on YouTube for the most current updates. You can find links to these and more information about us on our website at www.salempbchurch.com. Thank you again, and may you be blessed in the knowledge of our God and Father. and understand because there's differences between men and women and us men need a lot of time to figure out what women are saying even though they claim to be saying it plainly the longer I'm with her the better I understand those little things that she's saying the longer we study Christ the better we understand those little things that we used to miss that we overlook and He's like, I've been telling you all along, and we're just sitting down here, well, I just wasn't listening. What a blessing it is that God gives us that comparison. And, and the, the privilege that we have of having His Spirit inside of us, sharing with us the things of Christ, and the, the blessing that we have that He gives us His Word so that we can study Him better. And I've been trying for some time to be going to Scripture and learning our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, more and more. And... Reality is every sermon is doing that. Every time I come before you, I'm supposed to be as Paul and know nothing before you except for Jesus Christ and Him crucified. There ought to be a little bit of that in every sermon that's presented to you. But I have been trying for some time, been trying to focus on understanding Him better and seeing the things of Him. And Jesus... Well, absolutely, 100%, he came to save his, his people. Matthew 1, For she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Both of those things happened. Amen. She had a son. Because the angel told her, you shall have a son. She had a son. The angel told her, you shall call his name Jesus. They called his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Amen. Jesus did that. So absolutely, Jesus is our Savior. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And the descriptions and the things about him could go on and on. But we also see Jesus' life. That according to Ephesians, he laid it down for his church. He gave his life for his church. And his life was a life of teaching. One of the few things that we, we know of Jesus in his youth, one of the only things recorded of him in his youth is around age 12, when him and his parents went back into Jerusalem, he went into the temple and spent days there. I can remember as a, a small child, a young child, an older child really even, going to church meetings that would be all day Thursday, all day Friday, all day Saturday. And by middle of the day Friday, I can remember looking at mom and dad and thinking, this is a whole lot of church. <laughs> but Jesus at age 12 spent days. They were three days away from Jerusalem before they even realized he was gone. Spent three days coming back to Jerusalem and he was still there talking with the the prophets and talking with lawyers and those that understood the law and studied the law, both asking questions and answering questions, and they were marveled both at his questions and his answers. At age 12, he was preparing for his ministry. That blows my mind. 
So for the small child Jesus to be preparing for his ministry, I'd say his ministry is a big part of him that we need to know and understand. Amen? Amen. So I've been trying for the last few weeks to begin looking at the teachings of Christ and starting here in the Sermon on the Mount. And I want to, if the Lord be with us, to continue where we left off last week. If you would read with me again, Matthew 5, starting in verse 17. It says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. We're going to pause there just very temporarily this morning. We spent the bulk of our time last week looking at the 19th and 20th verse of the Sermon on the Mount. Looking at the reality that Jesus says the law shall not pass away. Jesus coming in his teachings and the things that he brought were not brought to destroy the law or the prophets. He did not come to destroy the Old Testament. He came to fulfill it, to bring it to its fullness, to fill in all the types and shadows. We sang this morning, it is finished. All the, all the shadows, all the types, all of the things that you could spend years looking at the tabernacle and the temple and the Ark of the Covenant and the things that are in the Old Testament and they all are types and shadows of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ coming and he is the fulfillment of that. He fills in all the gaps. He, he, he puts the light on those shadows and those things that we look at and we can vaguely see him. He is the fulfillment of that. He didn't come to destroy the Old Testament. He came to bring it to its clarity and bring it to its fullness. If it was a, a cistern that had just a little bit of water in it, once Jesus got here, it filled up till it started running over the top. Does that make sense? That's essentially what he's saying. And we looked at 19 and 20, how the, those that break the commandments and teach others to do so will be the least in the kingdom, and those that teach and practice the law, they'll be great in the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> And at that time, most, if they would have heard that statement, those that do the law and teach men to do so shall be called the greatest. What would come to mind is scribes and Pharisees. They were the pinnacle. They were the peak of religion. They were those that, the scribes being those that studied and wrote the law and copied it down to its completion and its fullness without mistake. If it had one comma missing, then it was to be thrown out and they were to start over. I mean, they were the ones that understood. And the Pharisees were the ones that studied it and gave the law and gave the, the, the meaning of the law and were to uphold the law. So that would be the ones that people would say, well, those are the ones that do and teach men to do so. So they've got to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Does that make sense? I'm trying to give just a real quick summary. Bring us about where we're at here this morning. Jesus says, if you're looking at the scribes and Pharisees and saying, they're it, they're great, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, put yourself into the shoes of these disciples. These Jews that he's talking to. Remind you again, he came unto his own. He told his people not to even go unto anyone else. He came to seek the lost sheep of Israel. He wanted to go to the Jews and the Jews only at the beginning. Told them not to go unto the Sumerians. So he's talking to Jews that looked and understood, and the Pharisees stood before them and taught them every week in the synagogue. They were the ones teaching. And then Jesus comes, the Messiah, the one that's going to make the fullness of this and is going to make everything plain to them. And he comes to you. Y'all put yourself in their shoes. 
And I come to you this morning and say, unless your righteousness exceed the best pastor, preacher you've ever met in your life, unless you exceed that, you can't even get into the kingdom of heaven. Imagine the gut shot. <sighs> I mean, just picture. Y'all all got one. I know you've got a favorite preacher, pastor. I've got a few in my head that I want to be like when I grow up. So, yeah, I know you've all got one. So just think about it. Unless you're greater and exceed them, you can't even get into the kingdom. What? How are we supposed to do that? So we spent the majority of our time trying to look at that last week and seeing that the scribes and the Pharisees, they're not the pinnacle and the peak. I tell you, your pastors and your teachers, they're not the pinnacle and the peak. I make mistakes. I've told y'all, I've confessed, and as much as I try and I strive at it, I'm an epic just enougher. Always have been. I have to try hard to not settle. I settle real easy. I'm not the peak and the pinnacle. I make mistakes. We're not the focus. Unless we exceed this righteousness... What does that mean? Aren't y'all thankful that, it, that the sermon didn't end there? He didn't give that gut shot of, unless you're better than the scribes and the Pharisees, you can't even get in. Thank you all. Good night. Yeah. He continued on. I tried to give it to you in great detail last week, but I give it to you in a summary. What he is saying by exceeding the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees is not about being holier than them. It's not about being holier than thou. It's not about being better than them because we all make mistakes. The, the, the reality of what he's talking about when he says, unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, is unless your righteousness goes further than theirs. It doesn't stop where theirs tends to stop. And Jesus begins to give us examples of these things. And I tried to last week, just very briefly in closing, I tried to give you just a few little thoughts and get you thinking about this. As Jesus goes through this, and I want to pick up there again this morning. If you would read with me, continue on here, and starting in verse 21. It says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. I don't want to stop there for today. Unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus starts with a big one. He says, You have heard. Again, he's talking to the Jews. He's talking to those that know the law. He's talking to those that have been taught the law, that understand the law. And he starts off with, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. He starts off with the sixth commandment that was given in the Mosaic law. Number six in the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not kill. You've heard that. 
You all know that. If you remove Christianity, the world would tell you that. Whether they believe in God or not, if you kill somebody, people are going to look down on you. That's not looked on well. It kind of goes without saying. But that's where the scribes and the Pharisees would tend to go. Thou shalt not kill. And if you kill, then you shall be in danger of the judgment. And you know what the judgment was? The judgment was, is if you kill, so shall you be killed. That was the judgment. And that's where they would stop. I gave it to you briefly last week just as a, a point of thought. Consider Saul of Tarsus. When he had letter, he had been given permission by the Jew church, by the Jews, to go into the Christian church and drag them out. And if they did not recant, to have them killed. He had permission to do so. And even though he had permission to do so, he would not physically do the stoning, but he would stand there and hold the coats as they were stoned. They would teach plainly that if you kill, then you will be killed. If you murder, then you will be murdered. Brothers and sisters, I want y'all to know this is a law of God. This is an understood moral law. And, and this is, and I could chase rabbits with this and get off onto tangents and rants, but I can tell you, if you want my honest opinion, one of the biggest problems with today's judicial system is they have forgotten this. That if you kill, you shall be killed. And that's not unfair. That's God's law. Yes, I'm a proponent for capital punishment when it's right to do so. Scripture says plainly that if the punishment doesn't equal the crime, then people are going to do what they want to do. And here we are. It is the law of God. That if you murder someone, it is wrong. If you murder someone, you deserve to die. Plain and simple. And y'all are thinking, okay, preacher, move on. Careful what you wish for. Jesus says that's the law. But listen to the next verse. But I say... Now we're getting to know Jesus. Jesus says the law states plainly, thou shalt not kill, and if you kill, you shall be in danger of the judgment. The, the, if you look in the old law, you can see where those that murdered, there was no exception. They were to be killed. If you killed someone by accident, there were uh, cities that were reserved for that. That you could go there until people's anger would settle down. There was accidental murder. There was accidental manslaughter. And it had a different judgment on it than what murder had on it. The law is plain. And I'm thankful that God gives us that. To know it and to understand it. But do y'all want to know Jesus? You want to know what he says? It's great to know what the letter of the law says, but how about the writer? What does he... Y'all think about that? What about the writer? What did he mean when he wrote it? That's who we're talking to. Y'all ever consider that? Jesus wrote these laws. He didn't just know them. He wrote them. Jesus is God. God is Jesus. They're one and the same. And this law was given by him. He says, but I say. This is the heart of Christ. This is what, where he goes with it. I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. There are a few words in that that are very important that I want you to see that I want you to understand. He says, I say unto you, if anyone is angry with his brother without a cause, 
is in danger of the judgment. We need to be glad those words are in there. There is a right time to be angry. Paul tells us in Scripture, be angry and sin not. It is possible to be angry and not sin. God gets angry. Are you going to say God sins? When Jesus went into the temple and saw what was going on in the temple and began to flip tables over and drive people out with a whip, I tell you, Jesus was angry that day. Was he sinning? Absolutely not. Jesus says, I tell you, if you are angry with your brother without a cause, then are you in danger of the judgment. There are times to be angry, and there are times that you should not be angry. I want to give you three examples. Any of y'all ever raised kids? Okay. Any of you ever dealt with kids? Okay, so we can all... Any of you ever been a kid? Okay, so everybody can relate. Everybody can listen. There's a right and a wrong time to be angry. The first time that my child lies to me, I have no right to fly off the handle angry. I know they're lying to me. You girls listening? Y'all don't get by near as much as you think you do. I know full well they're lying to me. When you're raising kids, you've all got this to deal with. There's that time that you're, you're, standing, you're asking your child what happened, and they're going, I don't know. <laughs> and you know full well they know exactly what happened. The right thing to do in that situation is work with them. The wrong thing to do and the sinful thing to do and the thing that will put you in danger of the judgment is when they come to you that first time and you know full well they're lying to you and you just fly off the handle mad and angry and just berating them and just, there ain't no call for that. When I'm at work and I give a task, being a manager, I give out tasks to people. That's, that's what I do. I schedule my day and I make sure everybody's got what they need to do for the day. And I give someone a task that I know they should be able to do within about 45 minutes to an hour. And I look up and it's 55 minutes and they're not quite done yet. And they're... They're, I mean, they're almost there, but they're not quite, and I see them looking at their phone. Is it right for me to go out there and grab their phone and smash it on the ground and fly off the handle and just go to throwing a hissy fit? Anybody ever work with somebody like that? You know what you do when that happens? You judge them. You know what they deserve? To be judged. They're in danger of the judgment. If they've been working at it, they're not quite done, but they're real close. The wrong thing to do is to be angry and throw a fit. Now, you look up out there. Here's the difference. I give them something that should take them 45 minutes to an hour, and I look up, and it's been 55 minutes. They've not turned a single wrench, and they're leaned up against the wall, and they're talk playing on their phone, and they're talking with everybody else in the shop. I have every right to go out there. The car's still sitting outside. It hasn't even been touched, and the bay is empty. They have zero excuses. I have every right to be angry as their boss and chew them up one side down the other and tell them to get to work. But if they're making an effort and there's being an issue and there's something going on and they're having a hard time, it is not right for me to be angry without a cause. Y'all see the difference? 
The second time that child does something foolish and you look at them and you've had the conversation, you've talked to them, you've explained to them what lying is, you've explained to them that God says lying is wrong, you have the conversation with them and they tell you and they show you that they understand it's wrong to do so and you tell them, you ha what happened? I don't know. You have every right to be angry at that point because they are lying and they know it is wrong and you have every right as the authority of the parent to be angry in that situation. Y'all see the difference? That is okay. When you are angry without a cause, then are you in danger of the judgment. The second way that you are angry without a cause is whenever you are in that same situation and you've gotten angry and you have chastised them to whatever needs to be done and you have explained to them again and you go through the situation, you go out there to that worker that's not doing anything and you pull the car up to them and say, get after it and they get the job done and you come back there to them next week and you berate them again or you come to your child the week after you've already gone through all of this and you're down on them again, you need to hush your mouth. Because you know what you're going to do when you have a boss that's like that with you? You're going to judge them. And when other people are watching, you know what they're going to do? They're going to judge you. And you know what they have every right to do? Judge you. That is angry without a cause. You've dealt with that. You've worked that out. That's angry without a cause. And Jesus says you are in danger of the judgment. The third one that scripture touches on, and my last example before we move a little further, the third example is if you're angry without a cause, and I'm guilty of this one from time to time, because I can't keep track of everything at work. I try, but I can't. I probably should let go of a little more than what I do. But I'm sitting in the office and I hear a piece of a conversation. I hear just a piece. And there's a part of that conversation I don't like. And I jump to the conclusion that someone is doing something that they shouldn't. And I jump up out of the office and I come around and I go to throw in a tantrum and I'm just getting mad. And from one side to the other and everybody in the office is looking at me like I've lost my mind. You know what they're doing? They're judging me. You know what they should do? They should judge me and they should tell me, why don't you hush for a minute and ask a question? Because I'm jumping to conclusions. I'm going off a of hearsay. I don't know the truth. Being angry without knowing the truth is being angry without a cause. If you don't, Scripture tells us this in the book of Proverbs. If you don't know that something is true, don't sit at home mad at them. You know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to ask. If you heard something you don't like about somebody, you know what you need to do? Not ask the person that told you. You know what that's called? Gossip. You know what gossip, gossip is? Sinful. You know what it causes? Anger without a cause. You know what anger without a cause brings about? The judgment. Well, y'all thought I was being harsh when I said if you kill somebody, you're going to be in trouble. Jesus says, if you do this, then are you in danger of the judgment? Being angry without a cause, we should not be doing that. Jesus starts this uh, conversation in this case study of the law with us. That's a lesson that we need to learn. As Christians, as those that want to study Christ and those that want to understand His heart and how it is that, that He would teach the law and how it is that Jesus would have us to learn how to be Christians, 
This is a lesson that's easily overlooked here, but in, again, the longer you study him and the longer you're with him, you, you understand those little subtle things that he doesn't just come right out and say, but you see it in his teachings. Pay attention to how Jesus teaches here. He says, start with yourself. If you are angry without a cause, you are in danger of the judgment. If you cry out to your brother Raka, you shall be in danger of the council. Now, I touched on this briefly last week as well, but just to remind you, Raka there means vain fellow. It, it, but it's more than that. Again, I, I'm going to make comparisons to, to real world living so everybody can understand what I'm saying. When, when one of my guys at work does something that's just foolish, I have every right to say, you know, that was really dumb. Why did you do that? Why didn't you do this instead? If I'm doing that in a spirit of trying to correct them and help them and build them up and teach them better, there's a constructive criticism Jesus used it. It's okay to do that in an effort to turn them and direct them. They spend an hour looking for something and they didn't check the fuse. Hey, why don't you start over here with the 10 cent part before you tell them they need a thousand dollar part? I didn't even think to check that. Well, that was dumb. Start with the simple stuff. Raka comes from a place of anger. You're not trying to correct them. You're not trying to instruct them. You're not trying to bring about repentance. You're trying to tear them down. This is when you are angry without a cause and you see that it's starting to build. If you are angry without a cause, you're already in danger of the judgment. This is a fun little fact that uh, I'd like to point out here. He says, if you are angry without a cause, you're in danger of the judgment. If you cry out Raka, then you're in danger of the council. If you uh, call him a fool, then you're in danger of hellfire. He's talking about uh, Jewish law there. There were three levels. If you murder, then you will be murdered. If you uh, are found guilty, you can be beheaded. He equals that one to the same thing as murder. If you're sitting around being angry, you can be beheaded. You can be put to death. If you cry out Raka, then you can be found in danger of the council. That's when you are brought before the council and they judge you when you were stoned. That's another level. Then there's the third, which is the highest that you can be brought before them and they take you out of the gates and burn you. That's what he's talking about here. That's the comparison that he's making. Sin has a potential. It has the ability. It has a nature, just like everything else. It has a nature and it's one that grows. It gets worse. It doesn't get better. Jesus says if you're angry without a cause, that's when you need to be paying attention and you need to stop that. If you have no right to be, and when your child comes to you and they lie to you and you know full well they're lying to you, but you've not had that conversation, you know what you need to be using? Grace and mercy and settle down and teach. When they come to you and they do it again, and you have every right to be angry, but you know what you need to do. You need to settle down, and you need to chastise as needed, and you need to teach. Be angry and sin not. When you don't know the truth, you need to settle down, and you need to find out the truth. That's the beginning. When you're angry without a cause, that's the time to stop and settle down. Because when you let it build, then you find yourself crying unto your brother, Raka. 
you're coming from a place of anger. You're not trying to correct your child, telling them that you shouldn't lie. You're hollering and screaming at them, and you're calling them everything that you shouldn't. You should be keeping in your mouth shut, but you're just flying off the handle, and they're not learning anything but scared. God gets angry, but he doesn't do that. He teaches. The raka here is not in a way of correction or building up. It's a way of tearing down. You're starting to, you're already destroying them and tearing them down. When you cry out, thou fool, now you're just straight up judging them. Now you're just straight up trying to destroy them openly. You've gone from angry to just ready to commit murder. You are in danger of the judgment. You are in danger of hellfire. And that's not talking about hell. It's talking about fierce punishment that God does not excuse us from. The judgment of this world, God does not excuse us from. The last verse that he points out here, Verily I say unto you, Thou shalt in no means come out till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing, puts that plainly. As Christians, it does not excuse us from the judgments of this world. He will not excuse us from that. If we mess up, we're going to pay the price. If we make a mistake, we're going to pay the price. And he's not going to excuse us from that. If we choose to do so, we're not going to be excused. He starts off here with us. Jesus says, start with yourself. If you're angry without a cause, you're in danger of the judgment. If you say to your brother, Raka, and that's not just talking about your physical brother, that's your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's anybody that you deal with. If you're being angry with them and you're letting it go further, then you're in danger of the council. And if you continue on further than that, and you're to the point that if you crossed paths with them, you would put the knife in their chest. You're already too far gone. The knife hasn't been thrusted. The trigger hasn't been pulled. The poison's not been put in the cup. But you're already there. And Jesus says, you're already too far gone. Does that kind of get your attention? So he says, start with yourself and careful of what you do. But then he gets off into something that we don't tend to think about. We think the law stops there. But he continues on, he says, therefore... <clears throat> If thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way first to be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Jesus says, again, this is not just what the law says, this is what Jesus says unto us. If thy brother has anything against you, you know whose problem that is? Yours. And you ever thought of that? He says, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remembers that thy brother has anything against you, this isn't any more about you having something against your brother. This isn't any more about you sitting in the church being mad at the person on the other pew. This isn't any more about you sitting in church being mad at your neighbor. This isn't any more about you sitting in the church being mad at somebody else. This is about you're sitting in the church knowing full well you ticked somebody off last week and saying, oh, well, that's their problem, not mine. Jesus says, you have no right 
to prevent your, present your offering if you're in that place. It's the wrong time. We as Christians, we as disciples, we as children of God, we as those that know, I tell you, y'all can see the church in this. I told y'all when we started this, when going into the Sermon on the Mount, if you were to put a title on the Sermon on the Mount, it would be Kingdom Living. He touches on everything that has to do with our life. He touches on everything that has to do with the church. He, I mean, it is deep in here. And when you're looking at this, you can see the problems that are among the Lord's church. You can, I, 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 I know I'm not alone in this. That if y'all stop and thought for just a little while, you can start picturing different people that aren't here right now. And you can find them even just in this first law that he gives. Well, preacher said thus and thus from the sermon, so I'm not ever going there again. Angry without a cause. Well, so-and-so in the church said this and this, so I told them don't ever come back. Angry without a cause. I mean, you can find the church even just in this first one. Jesus says, if you, come to the, if you come to the congregation and you're ready to present your offering and you're, you know in the back of your mind, y'all see the act, the thoughts. I mean, this just gets bigger and bigger the longer you read this and look at this. We're supposed to be on purpose when we're presenting to God. We're supposed to be mindful of ourselves when we're presenting ourselves to God. Y'all know what our sacrifice is, right? Romans 12 and 1. Present your body as a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable unto Him, which is your reasonable service. I'm not asking you to, I'm not talking about when you go to put your lamb up here or you go to put your turtle dove up here. I'm saying if you're going to live for the Lord and you're supposed to be mindful of yourself when you do this, He throws it in there again. And you know full well that last week, you and a, a brother in the church or you and the sister in the church or you and one of your relatives or you and somebody at work had an outing last week and you, you know that you're at odds with each other. You know who needs to go back to them? The Christian. As a child of God, we are supposed to be the ones that go out of our way to mend relationships. We're supposed to be the ones that go out of our way to forgive others. God tells us in his word in the New Testament that we are supposed to forgive as Jesus forgave us, as God forgave us. Even as Christ was willing to lay down his life for us, he was willing to come and die for us when we were yet sinners. He was willing to do that. We are supposed to just as equally be willing to forgive those that sin against us. He doesn't even put a, a, a disclaimer on this one. That if you remember your brother has anything against you, right or wrong. He doesn't say it's okay if you're at the church and your brother has something against you and he's got no right to do so. Then you're fine. Go ahead. He says, if you know you've got a brother or a sister or somebody you know that's got something against you, we are to be the ones that's supposed to go out of our way to try to mend that relationship. We are the ones that are supposed to go to them. He says, leave your gift. Put it before the Lord and get out of there. Leave your gift before the altar and go thy way first. Be reconciled to your brother. Go and be there first. First off, be on purpose. Jesus was on purpose for coming to this world and dying for us. Jesus was on purpose for doing that. He set his face as a flint towards Jerusalem and would not be moved. I am on purpose going to the cross to die for my people and I will see to it that it happens. Jesus says we need to be the same way, be on purpose going to them and asking forgiveness. Because 
Y'all are all thinking, boy, preacher, you could have picked something else. This is the problem when you study scripture. You're going to have to go things you don't like. The reality of a disagreement in this world is both of you probably messed up. Everybody likes to say there's the right way and the wrong way, and then there's everything else. No, the reality is when two people are fighting, both of you wind up in the wrong. There's your way, their way, and then there's the right way. And it's usually somewhere in the middle. Both sides have something to forgive. I can tell you, as long as I've been married, there's been times my wife has had every right to be angry with me. And there's been times she's been angry and she shouldn't have been. And same here. But you know whose responsibility it is to go to her and say, I'm sorry? It's mine. Jesus says to leave your gift at the altar and go thy way first and be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer. Agree with thine adversary. Boy, now that's hard. Agree with thine adversary whilst thou art in the way. Realize our own faults and be willing to do so. That's what Jesus says the law tells us. This is how our righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. We're just cut it off with the murder. Real quickly in closing, go with me to Genesis chapter 4. Real quick. I don't have a whole lot of time, but I just want to look at this real quick. This would be a case study that they would use. The very first murder. And I hadn't thought about it until this morning, but when you consider the words of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, you can find the issues on both sides. And I want you all to think about it. Genesis chapter 4. I want to start in, uh, well, we'll just start in the first verse. It says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the first things of, the flock, of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering." But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Now I'll stop there for right now. The very first murder, the very first killing that's recorded in Scripture. Cain and Abel, two brothers. And we know the main points of this story, so I'm not going to get lost in them because I don't have much time left in the day. So I want y'all to look at this and see how it progresses and see what Jesus is teaching in his Sermon on the Mount. You have two brothers. They've been raised up. They've been brought up. They've been brought up right, been brought up well. They're bringing their sacrifices unto the Lord. Cain is bringing his first fruits of his work, and Abel is bringing first fruits of his work, and they're both bringing them unto the Lord. And we all know that it's by faith that Abel presented and Cain that didn't, and that's where the difference between the two comes from. But in some way or another, whatever the case may be, Cain sees and understands that God has respect unto Abel's and not his own. Now, whose fault is that? Was it Abel's? No, it was Cain's. But where does Cain put the fault? On his brother. 
He's angry. His countenance falls. He finds himself angry, and he's angry all in the wrong places. He's not angry with himself. He's not looking at himself. He's not trying to figure out what's wrong. God even says unto him, if you'll turn around, you'll do right. Will I not have respect unto you too? It doesn't change him. You know what he is? He's angry without a cause. See where it started? Yeah, jealousy. That's what it boils down to. See where it started? And he doesn't let it go. He holds on to it. And he goes and he talks. He confronts him. He confronts Abel. I imagine there was some probably some rockas and some foolishness that was thrown out there. We're not given privilege to know everything that was conversed and everything that was said there. But Cain goes to Abel in the field and confronts him and gets angry to the point that he smites him. He's, he kills him right then and there. Now, the law would say 100% Cain is at fault. Cain is a murderer. God judges Cain and tells him he's a murderer and marks him as thus. Amen? That's the letter of the law. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, think a little further. You imagine Abel saw that there was an issue with his brother as he was presenting over there. You think maybe he could have gone to his brother and settled him down a little bit? Talk to him a little bit. Explain to him a little bit. At least made an effort. Y'all seeing it? That's us. That's Jesus' heart when it comes to the law. That we're supposed to go further than just the physical murder and see I could let somebody sit over there and be so angry with me that they murder me. And I could have had a chance to talk to them. Could have had a chance to apologize to them. Just gives you something to think about. That's the fulfillment of the law. That's the heart of Christ. He's not just about our actions. He's about our thoughts. He's about our intents. And brothers and sisters, the longer we go through this sermon, the more you're going to see. And they'll get a lot better from here, I promise. They won't all be this hard. But the longer we study the Sermon on the Mount, and the longer we study what Jesus says a Christian is, the harder it gets for us. Because there's no room for pride. There's no room for holiness. There's no room for look at me. There's no room for look how good I am. There's no room for I've attained and all of the rest of you are suckers. There's no room for that. Our life becomes one that we're looking for those that are caught up in anger. We're looking for those that I may have offended. And I'm supposed to go out of my way to be the one to go to them and try to heal that. And go to them and mend that. When I'm the one that hears a piece of a conversation and comes out of the office and just, am just back to the point of fighting mad. To everybody's looking at me like I've lost my mind. I'm the one that's supposed to realize I've lost lost my mind and openly this is going to require your mouth moving openly confess my foolishness and apologize and mend that well that's hard that's Christianity that's a fuller righteousness than the scribes and the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees, they would have said, well, I didn't kill him. I sure wanted to. 
but I didn't kill him. Jesus says that's not good enough. Y'all think about that. I thank you and God bless. I will sing the wonder story of the cross. Thank you again for joining us at Salem Primitive Baptist Church. I pray that the Word of God may brightly shine in your lives. If you would like to contact us or would like to download a copy of today's message, please go to www.salempbchurch.com. God bless you all. Who died for me? Sing it with. Sing it with. The saints in glory. The saints in glory. Gather by. Gather by the crystal sea. The crystal sea. I will sing the wondrous story of the cross. Thank you again for joining us at Salem Primitive Baptist Church. I pray that the Word of God may brightly shine in your lives. If you would like to contact us or would like to download a copy of today's message, please go to www.salempbchurch.com. God bless you all. Who died for me? Sing it with. Sing it with. The saints in glory gather by, gather by the crystal sea, the crystal sea.